Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out new episodes of the show every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. If you missed an episode or want to get more information about the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Manpreet Singh. He's the president and co-founder at Talk Local. Manpreet, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Excited to be on. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. You guys are doing something really interesting with uh, Talk Local, but maybe before we kind of get into that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I grew up in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland, uh, in a small okay. town called Burnsville. Okay. Uh, so I was born and raised in the, in the you know, near the DC metro area. Um, didn't really move around too much, especially uh, I guess the beginning part of my life. The first, most of the first eighteen years were on the same county, Montgomery County. Right. Uh, um, I grew up with one brother, um, parents, um, a lot of uh, family close by. Okay. Uh, my dad had uh, nine, uh, has nine brothers and sisters, and all our relatives. Wow. Uh, are, are local, right? So a lot of cousins, uncles, on um, so weekends were really filled with uh, family and going to the church. That's great, man. S- so, Thanks. so you you went to University of Maryland. What did you kind of take there, and what was the reason you decided to go into that? Yeah, so I senior year of high school, just junior and senior of high school. My brother and I had a startup, okay, uh, called DC Lives. And because we were running the startup, I got really interested in uh, entrepreneurship, startups, uh, you know, finance. And I ended up uh, applying to a few different schools, um, Was got into Maryland and NYU. I decided at that time I wanted to do a business. Right. I was pretty close to going to NYU for undergrad. Uh, at the time, I think it was the number two program in the country for finance. And uh, I decided to stay in Maryland. One, I got a scholarship for you know most of the tuition nice. and i started working thank you i started working uh for a uh a local investment firm uh okay. as an intern and so i kind of wanted to do the the work uh in, in the field of finance and go to school at the same time and so i decided to stay local okay no very very cool that make that makes a lot of sense so before we kind of continue on your education path, you, you mentioned you had a startup with your brother. What was it, and how did you guys decide to found it? Yeah, it was it was really my brother uh, who kind of started initially. It was a website called DisneyVibes.com, and okay. it was essentially a South Asian uh, social networking site. Okay. Um, I think he came up more with the idea because he heard of uh, so around the time there was a company called BlackPlanet.com or Asian Avenue. And there were a few different sites um, dedicated to different uh, groups a- in the U.S. And there wasn't one focused on South Asians or Indians. Gotcha. And so he kind of thought, why don't we create one for Indians? Uh, and so that's kind of how it kind of all started. Okay. So you guys did that for a while. You were obviously in post-secondary at university at the time. Um, kind of walk me through kind of how long did you guys do the startup for and, and what kind of made you kind of end it? Yeah, yeah. So we started and we were in uh, high school. Um, my brother was, I guess, his first year of college at the time. I was in high school a couple of years apart, and he just coded it up. And it, it, we started. I we were into. Um, I was pretty social at, in high school, and so we started promoting the site to other South Asians. And where we really kind of caught on and got a lot of attention is we rolled out a like a chatting kind of message board. Oh, very cool. And. Um, yeah, so it, what ended up happening is a lot of people started using this site after, like, weekend parties, like Friday night, Saturday night parties that were happening in, like, Maryland area, D.C. area, right. and a lot of the colleges and would ask, like, hey, did anyone see that girl wearing red? Or, hey, anyone <laughs> see that guy wearing X, Y, and Z? And so we started – what ended up happening is everyone would start coming to the website every Saturday morning or Sunday morning <laughs> to see how that party was. Right. Um and that's how we kind of got the attention. And so once that kind of caught on, we, we we had like Indian MP3s on the site. We had um, we started rolling out ticketing, so you could actually buy your tickets to these different events on our website. We rolled out um, music, listen to music, 
Uh, we started, we put together an email list of subscribers. We had, you know, party promoters and event planners pay us to advertise on the site and wow. the email marketing. And so, yeah, we, it was actually, yeah, at one point we got as high as I think 300,000 unique, uniques a month. Uh, it was, and if you search like actresses, Indian actresses, a lot of different Indian terms, um, we ranked very high on all of at the time. One big number one, number two. Sure. Um, we, go ahead. No, I was going to say like for that time period, that was that's a huge amount of traffic, right? Like in in that because this like if I'm if I'm correct, it's this was what like late nineties, early two thousands. Yeah, it was ninety nine two thousand. Yeah, so um, you guys did an incredible job um, at the time, like with that much traffic, right? Yeah, yeah, we ended up, so we were in high school, and so my brother was, like, not taking a lot of classes in school, at college, and, you know, just 100% focused on this. I still have had to go to high school, but I was able to convince my superintendent to let me leave school early every day. Really? Um, so I ended up having AP classes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I met with the principal in the high school, because uh, they had heard about this, but, you know, kids in school were talking about it. And, sure. And teachers had heard about it, and so I convinced him to let me leave school early. I would leave school like at 11 a.m. every day after doing like my AP classes in the morning. And we actually brought in a bunch of interns, had some employees, and so we were starting to generate some real revenue, and we were, we were rocking. Um, we, I guess, where 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 kind of ended up going is we one, it 2000 happened. So right. at one point we were getting paid 20. Thirty dollars, you know, TPM for advertising. Th- those rates started sinking, mm-hmm. and my, uh, I guess my parents were getting this pressure, like, hey, they don't understand the internet, they don't understand the dot com thing, and we're like, you need to go to school and focus on school. Right. And so finally, we ended up um, the domain name ended up getting sold to somebody else. Um, but it, a lot of the social media kind of stuff didn't really caught on, or social networking didn't really start start on until like two thousand five. Four, sure. five, six, a couple of years later. Um, so maybe we were early. I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah, you guys were ahead of your time, right? That's that's great, man. I, I love stories like that. So you you went back again to school and you got your MBA. Do you want to kind of walk me through the rationale behind going getting that? Yeah, yeah. So I guess fast forward a little bit. I ended up the same investment firm I ended up interning at while I was in, I guess, in high school. Right. I ended up staying there. 12 years uh-huh. um so we we grew the firm's assets when i joined from five million dollars in assets to over 2.2 billion wow uh, by the time i left so quite a bit in growth and so i guess it's 2006 7 where i was at, at the firm now five six years you know a couple of years out of school you know it got in promoted a few times um my we were having i guess some strategic discussions with some uh, um, public financial services companies looking to buy the firm. Okay. Um, we had been growing pretty fast, and we were strongly considering. We, my boss was strongly considering selling the company. It would have been actually a pretty good payday for me, and you know would have got a pretty senior title at the new firm. And but at the at the time, I was strongly considering. You know what? I I, I only went to Maryland. I, I don't. I got my CFA. I I always wanted to get my MBA, and I always wanted to go to Warden. Um, I applied for undergrad to go to Warden, did not get in. And so I said, you know what, why don't I, this might be a good opportunity maybe to apply to business school okay. um, and see what happened. And so I ended up um, applying to Warden and getting in. Very cool. So you, you leave Warden, what did you do then? Yeah, so it was interesting. So I, when I told my boss I was getting my, wanted to, I got into Warden, I, I told him I was applying and uh-huh. he said, I'll do a recommendation. But it was like kind of just wanted to talk me out of it and said, <laughs> why are you going to business school? You don't need to go. And, um, but if you really want to go, I'll support you. And so I ended up going and I ended up, I actually never left the firm. So we ended up working out a deal where I would, um, I would still maintain coverage of my, my sector. So I, I invested in internet and uh, tech companies and right. tele- telecommunication companies. And so I covered my portfolio while I was in school. I would check in with my boss every couple of days, you know, do calls with him. I would go to investor conferences and meetings if needed. And I would come to the office, you know, at least, um, you know, once a week or once every other week, uh, depending on my course load. So you were um, busy. So I was driving. <laughs> I was busy. So Warden was only like two hours away from my off, two and a half hours away from uh, my my office uh, in Maryland, and so it wasn't that far. So I ended up. I lived in Philadelphia, but I came back and forth quite a bit. Okay, interesting. So, at what point 
did you decide that you you know you want to do talk local and kind of walk me through what exactly is talk local and why did you decide to co-found it yeah so i guess fast forward a little bit more in 2011 i guess 2009 going back a little bit that's when i graduated from business school okay i ended up you know, still working for the investment firm i was with for a long time and i got really interested in private companies uh, okay I had a few friends from business school that were, you know, either starting private companies or investing in private companies. And, you know, we actually got introduced to a company called Alibaba at the time, right. um, which no, at the time we really heard of, you know, a sure. internet company in China worth, you know, a couple billion dollars. And we, through a good friend, we were able to invest in the company privately. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so it ended up being a pretty good win for us. So I got really interested in private and private markets back then got interested in marketplaces because of that investment and then got more interested in, I guess, local because of my, my brother and my other co-founder had a, had a business in uh, in the local services space. So they had a computer repair business called Geeks on Site. Okay. And uh, he had spent a lot of money in local uh, services. And so that's kind of how we got interested in local. Uh, and at the same time, I think Groupon and Link Social were, were pretty hot. And so kind of that's kind of how we got started. Okay, no, that that's that's really cool. So, for people that have never heard of Talk Local, what exactly is Talk Local? So, one of the biggest challenges um, uh, my brother uh, co-founder had with his business was that he would get calls from consumers who were frustrated uh, when they needed to find a computer repair professional. Right. Um, and so, when he was running that business, he realized that a lot of customers have difficulty finding local service professionals. So they so think like plumber, painter, electrician, and so forth. And so came up with the idea of why don't we create a website where a consumer can go to it and submit a request to find a, have a plumber call them back. And uh, that's what we created. Um, so Talk Local helps you find a local service professional uh, in 90 seconds. Wow, okay. So I, I definitely want to dive more deeper into Talk Local, but when you guys were starting this thing up, did you guys self-fund? Did you raise some money, a little bit of both, or, or kind of walk me through the early stages of actually getting a version one up and live online? Yeah, yeah. So we, um, three founders, and we, we started a meeting weekends, evenings, you know, after we all had jobs or I was working full time. Sure. And we, uh, we self-funded. Um, okay. So we, we decided to put in our own money at first. Um, I think initially it wasn't, a lot of money, maybe five or ten thousand dollars. Kind of when we first started, um, you know. To want, I guess a good thing is my both my co-founders were technical, and so they they were able to build, I guess, the original version of the site kind of on their own. Right. Uh, and so we have to spend a lot of money doing that, uh, but we did we did have to start spending money on other things shortly thereafter. Okay. No. Very cool. So. You, you kind of you quickly mentioned exactly what talk local is but so if I'm looking for a plumber for example what do I need to do and how do I use you guys yes yeah, so you can go to our website you can download our app uh, or call us I would okay. say the coolest way is using our app you can go to our app download it and it'll ask you you know what you need help with and you can describe your your need by talking to the device by pressing the record button. Okay. Uh, so you could essentially just say, my toilet's leaking, I need help Friday at 5, I'm in San Francisco. Uh, we then take those details of your request and broadcast them out to a bunch of local service providers, and we'll have one call you back uh, within a few minutes. Okay, very cool. So I pick up the phone, um, basically tell them what I need, or they already know what I need because I entered that in your app? Yep. Okay. Exactly. And they, already, they already know what you need. Okay, and then basically I give them my address and tell them to come, or, or how does that kind of work from, from that phone call? Usually that, usually at that point, the consumer and the company will end up having a conversation, maybe a more detailed conversation about the problem. Okay. And then they end up exchanging content information or end up booking an appointment. Okay. Uh, and then that vendor will end up showing up to your place. Gotcha. Um, our goal is to get you to speak to multiple vendors. So the goal is to get you to speak to two or three mm -hmm within a few minutes for you to quickly decide who you want with, who you want to work with. Got you. Okay. That's, that's very cool. And then obviously I pick one and then, you know, my thing gets fixed and I'm good to go. And then do I get to give them a review or rating or something? 
Absolutely. We'll follow up with you after you end up having a conversation, uh, as well as a week later to see if you ended up uh, working with that merchant and how the experience went. Okay, so you guys call me directly, or is it online, or it's up to me? It's uh, it's online through an email and text message. Okay, and then if I'm a service provider and I want to, you know, have you broadcast potential jobs to me, how do I go about doing that? Yeah, absolutely. So we, um, well, the first thing we did is a little bit unique. We actually brought in millions of businesses into our database okay. on day one okay. um, by kind of you know, crawling the web to kind of see what's out there and using different data points we've been able to get our hands on. Okay. Um, one example is a better business fair. We've been able to get data from the BEB. Oh, interesting. Uh, and try, try to get good data on, on merchants. Uh, if you're not already getting calls from us and would love to get calls from us, you can come to our website, talklocal.com, and, you know, claim your page and start to receive phone calls. Okay. Interesting. So, when you guys first rolled out this site and you obviously pulled in all these professionals in a bunch of different um, sectors, and we'll get into those in a second, um, did did you get – how did people kind of first react to, you know, when you guys first launched and you're calling these businesses saying, I have a job for you? Yeah, so the, the businesses were actually quite shocked. Um, sure. I, I don't think they ever got a call like this before from what we've gathered. Sure. Um they, some of them thought it was, you know, prank or fake. They didn't believe it. And they would usually it'd be very pleasantly surprised when there was a customer on the other line. Sure. Uh, and they ended up speaking to them. So I think on the merchant side, they were pretty excited to, to kind of work with us. Um, on the consumer side, I think what they what they ended up seeing when they first started using is they were pretty shocked at how fast it was. Okay. Um, so a lot of people you would hear on the phone that, oh my God, I, I didn't think you call so fast. I just had to go to the restroom, <laughs> right? And so, sure, sure. So you hear like comments like that on the recording, which is really, really kind of funny. That that's interesting. So, what verticals do you guys provide professionals and services in? We we do about forty plus categories today. Um, okay. Some of those verticals are home services. Okay. Um, auto, um, auto services, uh, some financial services, and uh, lawyers, and really even health health services. Um, we, we I would say we're better and do a lot more today in home services. Okay. And I would recommend using our platform for mostly home services today. Okay. So, where are you? Are you guys only in certain geographical regions, or or what cities are you guys located in, or or states? Yeah, so we, we are actually, we're nationwide today. So you can use the website almost everywhere in the country. Okay. Um, I'd say we're, we're definitely better uh, on, on, the, on the bigger cities. Um, sure. So think Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Boston, Austin, Miami, San Francisco, Seattle, Chicago. Sure. Kind of like what you would, we, we kind of call them Super Bowl cities. Right. I mean, although NFL cities. Right, right. Um, uh, but we, we, we have done requests uh, in almost... Uh, I think over a little over twelve or thirteen thousand zip codes to date, which is almost twenty five percent of the country. Wow, that's awesome. That's that's incredible. Um, so thank you. I, I'm curious then, how do you guys monetize uh, Talk Local? Yeah, uh, the merchants uh, are the ones that end up paying to for the service. Okay. So when they end up getting a call uh, about a particular need, typically that merchant. Um, Will press five. Uh, they'll end up speaking to a consumer. Uh, when they speak to that consumer about the problem, uh, they'll pay us a fee. Okay. Um, th- that fee will end up being like fifteen dollars for that conversation. Got you. Okay. It's just like a referral fee, then, kind of, right? Yep. Exactly. Okay. So, you, you, I know you got, and you've mentioned this a couple of times about kind of privacy and keeping things kind of anonymous until the consumer actually gives a service provider, you know, their address or phone number or whatever. How do you guys kind of do do that? Um, like, obviously, you guys are handling kind of the calling or, or walk me through kind of the privacy until I actually give my info to the provider. Yeah, absolutely. So a big part of it, it's, it's mostly private because we actually never give the vendor your name, number, or email address. We okay. only give them the about your job what when and where okay and it's up to the vendor to actually decide for the consumer to decide once you're speaking to them 
if you're willing to share your contact information with them. Um, we just bridge the call between the consumer and the company over the phone so we control that experience. Okay, okay. No, very cool. And then obviously, um, just, yeah, and then it's up to me to pick and then I get my, I give my details when I'm ready to actually select my provider. That makes the most sense. So, yep, yeah. So I'm curious to know, um, you, you mentioned you're in a bunch of categories. Are you guys um, looking to add anything in the near future or you guys are kind of happy with all the verticals that you're in now or kind of what are you guys looking to do kind of in 2017 and beyond if, if you can mention anything? Yeah, so we're we're actually not looking to expand categories right now. Okay. Uh, we are looking to do more volume in certain cities, I would say, across the country. Okay. Uh, but I'd say the kind of the current game plan is to focus on making it so you can use our services uh, everywhere. So not just having to come to our website or download our app, uh, but be, for you to be able to use our our services through like a, a Amazon Echo device or okay. through. Uh, my- on a, yeah, so we're kind of really focused on third-party integrations right now okay. uh, to drive future demand. Sure. So how have you guys kind of started? How did you guys get users or like consumers early on um, to actually start using the platform? Yeah, so originally it was a lot of PR, word of mouth. Um, we put together content to try to drive traffic through SEO. Okay. Um, so people for you know long tail kind of keywords we would be populate number one um a lot of it was done through that a little bit of sem obviously search engine marketing um you know it, it kind of we tried almost everything under the sun honestly flyer we try to go to like neighbors and pass off flyers you know we, we try, we've kind of tried it all really see I, I love hearing kind of how people started out right because i think a lot of it is trial and error right and you just alluded to that because you never like what could work for me might not may or may not work for you and and vice versa right and so i'm always curious to see how people kind of launch these things and so you guys must be kind of constantly scouring the internet for new professionals or or how does that kind of work to keep that database kind of fresh and and current across the country yeah, yeah, we do. We we spend a lot of time, money, effort on that. A lot of it's automated using, um, you know, artificial intelligence and looking at open APIs we can get our hands on um, that have really good data on merchants. You know, one example we mentioned is the Better Business Bureau. Right. But there's other ones that we work with as well. That's a big part of it. Um, the second thing I would say we're doing to kind of keep it fresh and clean is we, we try to get data or feedback from our users to figure out who they like, who they didn't like and so forth. Right. So when you guys were originally sending these um, professionals kind of clients or customers, did you guys have to spend a bunch of time kind of educating them on the platform or was it just pretty, pretty simple because you guys are using kind of technology that they're familiar with, like the phone and text and, and stuff like that? I think orig- you know, originally we did spend some time trying to educate. We launched DC as our first kind of market and a few different categories. Okay. We, we did spend some time doing that. But we, we realized as we were doing that that it was hard to kind of explain what we do without actually seeing it work live. Right. And, you know, like different and so forth. And so then we kind of went more towards a, a more simpler approach. We focused on just kind of just sending out, you know, real requests and getting merchants to engage and use the platform before trying to educate or talk to them. Interesting. Okay. So I, I'm curious then, did you guys eventually raise money to keep this thing kind of going or have you always kind of been self-funded? We did. We did raising some money. So we ended up raising some money uh, at the end of 11, beginning of 2012. Okay. Uh, we raised a round of uh, $1.3 million. Okay. Wow. That's awesome. Congrats. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, raising money is never, never as easy. And um, yeah, I guess we were able to raise it and it worked out well. And we were, we were happy we did that. Uh, we did end up raising some additional money uh, in 2014, you know, as we were able to prove out some of the initial metrics. Okay, sure. So um, you, you've raised a bunch of money, you've self-funded companies. 
and you're obviously you've done a few startups now and you've you've had a huge amount of you know interest and you have a background in kind of dealing with investments and whatnot what advice do you give kind of people that are looking to create a startup um you know i'm sure you get asked that every once in a while but i'm curious to know your thoughts on it because you've kind of been on both sides right yeah yeah, I, I would say if you're looking to create a startup, probably one of the most important things is uh, flush out your idea as much as you can. Okay. Um, you know, before trying to raise money and by flushing it out, try to figure out you know, not just what you want to do or how you want to do it, but really understand like, you know, what are the drivers of the business and things that are probably the most important. And so for a consumer internet business, it's driving users and driving users is never going to be easy, but, you know, try to test different ways of how you could drive those users before you actually go out and try to raise any money uh, and do small tests, you know, spend 1000 2000 5000 some small amount of money uh, to see what works and what doesn't work before you spend a lot of money and time building, you know, something that, you know, don't spend a million dollars building something, just go out and build something simple and try it out and see if people like it. Sure. So I'm, I'm curious, how long did you guys spend on your first version before you put it live? Good question. Um, was it like weeks, months? It was months. It was definitely okay. months. It wasn't okay. weeks. But yeah. you guys were also all weeks. working full time, correct? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah, we tested it, you know, maybe, hey, let's see, I can tell you right now, it was probably six months in we okay. tested it uh in the winter time when there was a winter storm to see if our system could work during a snowstorm for oh, snow removal work. But, okay interesting so you picked one vertical and decided to test it in 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 a snowstorm and then see if the platform worked so i'm curious how did that first kind of test go yeah it actually went really well i okay. think uh, i think it went so well we were we were shocked at the results really we never ever actually got results that good i think one of the reasons that test was so good is because you were it was a major snowstorm you know once every kind of 20 year kind of thing right um you had a captivated audience the users didn't really have anywhere else to go to find help right um what else was unique about it um and on the merchant side they were getting bombarded with requests they were kind of busy so it wasn't an ideal testing environment from that perspective uh, but it worked well. We were able to drive users that are at a low cost. We were able to get merchants to engage and use a product. Um, we It was very early in our development of our product, so we ended up using that data to kind of, uh, you know, redo a lot of things with our system. Okay. So, um, for, no, go so ahead. I, Keep going. For example, one of the things we, we know we, we learned in that test was that it was it would take a long time to get a merchant to respond because they were so busy. Okay. And we at that time we would try to we would try to dial out one merchant like every couple of minutes. Right. And by doing that, you ended up having the response time to the consumer be over like thirty minutes. Okay. Right. And no consumer is going to be happy for you waiting that long. And so we changed. We actually created an algorithm and changed everything based on the data we got from that test. Interesting. Okay. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and until you actually like put it out live, you, you probably wouldn't figure that stuff out, correct? You wouldn't, no. Yeah. You wouldn't at all. Interesting. So w- walk me through some other maybe examples of, of learning things that you did by launching, I would say early, right? Like you six months to develop a, a version one and test it, I think is, is pretty early. I think that's a good time frame. What what else did you guys kind of learn by actually launching pretty early and getting it in the hands of real users? Yeah, I think the merchant side was really important too. So I, I kind of touched on the fun briefly, but you know we spent like months and months, many many months, trying to educate merchants about our product, but right. they they would not get it. They didn't understand what we do. They didn't understand why we were different than you know other stuff they've been pitched in the past. And it really wasn't until they, we, they saw like a real demo or see, saw the request to go live and they really understood what we do. Sure. And so I think that was, that was really important, um, especially when you're, you're dealing with a lot of, I guess, blue collar yeah. um, kind of people that don't use a lot of tech on an everyday basis. Sure. Right. Um, and so I think that was important. Some of these buzzwords sometimes scare them. So <laughs> we, we, we learned like, uh, yeah, no reason to mention the word artificial intelligence. No reason to mention yeah. a lot of these words that you would 
typically talk to maybe an investor or, or somebody else about. But but I think that's really good advice to people listening, right? Because like you and I, for example, can have a conversation about AI or uh, you know whatever, right? Like, but you're right to somebody that doesn't play in that space, it freaks them out, right? So I think just knowing how to talk to the person you're talking to, whatever they are, or whatever their situation is, is really important. And I think sometimes it's like tech people. We forget that and like we use acronyms and all these things, right? That sometimes people just look at you like, what did he just say? <laughs> so I, I think that's... Yeah, yeah. It, it, scare, it really scares them like 100% about it. I mean, yeah. Sure. So when you first started, did you have a problem actually getting that um, com- kind of fee back from the actual service professionals? once you sent them a job or how did you guys kind of protect yourself from getting, making sure you actually got paid? Yeah. So we, we do something unique, actually. We, 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 if a commercial does not uh, signed up with us and does not have a credit card on file, okay, we allow the merchant not to pay us for that particular job. Okay. Um, the reason we do that is because we want to make sure the, the merchant uh, and the customer have a great experience. Um, you know, we're not just about monetizing all the leads that come to us, right. our requests that come to us. We're more about making sure the user has a good experience. Um, a good, I guess, analogy or, you know, to, to compare that to would be, you know, Google. A lot of people thought Google was crazy when they first started because they would sort of send links or referrals to websites that didn't pay Google. Yep. Right? Google only makes money on, like, a very small percentage of the clicks that actually come through it. Um, but if you remember 15 years ago, 16 years ago, a lot of these other websites were all performance based and you had to pay to be kind of listed at the top. Yeah. I remember those days <laughs> and, and pretty much none of those search engines are around anymore. Right? Yeah, exactly. So no, that's, that's actually really good advice that, right? Like, and I, I really believe in that too, where not everything you do needs to be for like a dollar, right? And just sometimes you need to do some stuff for free at first to maybe eventually convert them into a paying customer or maybe they never will be but it is what it is right and to your point like you want the user to have the best kind of experience right i think that's great 100 percent. yeah i think i think long term that wins yeah totally so i'm i'm we're kind of coming to the end of the show so for people that maybe tuned in a little bit later, do you want to maybe give kind of a quick overview again of what exactly Talk Local is? Yeah, Talk Local helps you find your next local service professional, like plumber, painter, or so forth, uh, within ninety seconds. Uh, that's that's simple. That's that's a good elevator pitch. That probably took you a while to come to get it down to that short and per, precise. I'm I'm guessing here. <laughs> It took us, honestly, it took a very long time. Yeah. I mean, probably six, six to nine months, maybe even longer. Really? That, the answer is, yeah, I could see that. That, that makes sense. But I, but I think that's also good advice in itself, right? Because, like, sometimes the, when it's so, like, simple and polished, takes the longest amount of time to get it there. Yeah, yeah, it does. I think uh, and, uh, you know, educating, you know, other entrepreneurs out there, the way we kind of got that refined and figured out was spend, you know, not brainstorming in our, in our, in our room or our basement, but was actually going out there and talking to other, you know, people in tech and regular people and trying to practice describe what we do to them. I know. I, I think that's really good advice actually. And you touched on something that I think is super, super important that people forget a lot of times is just like get out there and try it on people. Right. And try it on, your friends and family, try it on strangers, try it at networking events, try it wherever, right? And you're right, see what works and what doesn't work. And it could take months to figure out what works and doesn't work. 100%. No, that, that's great, man. So like I mentioned, we're kind of coming to the end of the show. So let's close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself and Talk Local uh, online. Yeah, absolutely. You can check us out on talklocal.com. Uh, you can download our app in the Android or I, iOS store uh, under Talk Local, um, two words. Um, or you can give us a call at um, 1-877-987-7382.
Perfect, man. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you, and have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Have a great day. Okay. Bye. Thanks for listening. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check them out at electricmantra.com and keep them in the future.